Hello and welcome to the virtual edition of the Ohio EMS Conference. My name is Eric Cortez and I serve as the System EMS Medical Director for Ohio Health. I'm joined by our System EMS Director, Holly Heron, and our Paramedic School Medical Director, Dr. Ann Dietrich. We would like to wish you all a happy EMS week and thank you for your service to your communities, your departments, your colleagues, and your patients. Unfortunately, we were unable to host our annual Ohio EMS conference this year. However, we had several EMS medical directors and emergency physicians that were eager to present exciting updates and other cutting edge information to our EMS partners. So we decided to organize this virtual conference as a replacement. The virtual conference will last approximately two hours. We have eight 10 minute high yield presentations from several of our EMS physicians. We will also be announcing the recipients of our annual awards, the John Moore Memorial EMS Award, the EMS Medical Director of the Year Award, and the Excellence in EMS Education Award. At this time, I would like to introduce our panel of speakers. Starting things off, we have Dr. Ryan Squire, who will be giving us an update on the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Andy Little and Dr. Laurel Barr will be discussing high-yield intubation strategies. Dr. John Casey will be discussing STEMI mimics and how they affect you as an EMS provider. Dr. Danny Schneider will provide an update on the cutting edge field of thrombectomy for strokes. Dr. Brad Ratsky will be reviewing ventilation strategies, especially during interfacility transport. Dr. Eric Kuby will be discussing hypoxia and hypotension in traumatic brain injury. And lastly, Dr. Beth Bobos from Nationwide Children's Hospital will be discussing high flow oxygen for pediatric patients. I want to thank all of our participants for taking part in this conference. Your expertise and knowledge is second to none, and we are very lucky to have you here with us. We'll go ahead and get things started now with Dr. Squire and the COVID updates. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Eric. And I'd uh, like to again uh, share your, your thank you out to EMS during EMS week for everything that they do for our communities. Um, and bring my presentation up. So uh, I have the pleasure of sharing uh, COVID-19 updates in pre-hospital care, um, which is obviously very pertinent being one of the reasons why we're unable to meet uh, in reality right now. Um, I work as an emergency medicine physician with Mid-Ohio Emergency Services and serve as the Associate Med Medical Director of our New Albany uh, Freestanding Campus. Um, also Medical Director for Buckeye Link Ambulance Service, Memorial EMS, as well as Southwestern Ambulance Service. As we talk about COVID-19, we're going to speak about the disease, uh, PPE, uh, exposure, return to work, and current testing uh, modalities as they exist. COVID-19 as uh, the uh, disease is a severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. Uh, this is what has formally become known as COVID-19 across the world. It is a class of RNA viruses as a coronavirus is, uh, and coronavirus is one of the main viruses that is responsible for the common cold every year. Uh, approximately 15% of common colds that we, ex we experience within the population are within that class of coronavirus, though so not of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, bats uh, and birds are common vectors uh, and able to spread this virus to humans. And currently uh, in the news and media, uh, you see discussions about influenza pandemics that we've had over the past century, including the pandemic of 1918 to 1919, 1957, 1968, as well as 2009 to 10. Influenza pandemics are vastly different um, than uh, what we're currently experiencing, but they're being utilized currently by a number of scientists and epidemiologists as we t uh, attempt to predict uh, what the future will hold as this pandemic unravels. COVID-19 um, is specifically not uh, influenza nor pandemic influenza. And there's a couple of key differences between influenza um, and COVID-19 and coronaviruses that we must understand. Uh, influenza, typically you're gonna see about a one to four day time period before someone demonstrates symptoms. Uh, whereas with COVID-19, you can see a two to 14 day window 
where our average is about five days currently. In addition, um, you'll see an influenza and an asymptomatic population of about 4 to 28 percent with an average of about 16 percent. Currently with COVID-19, uh, there's an estimate of about 25 percent are asymptomatic. So that number will surely begin to creep up as we increase our testing. Uh, and when we look at closed populations, um, such as uh, the Marion kind of prison system, where we saw that up to 95% of those that tested positive, in fact, had no symptoms. Um, when we look at the flu, um, you'll see viral shedding that's highest, meaning that the highest potential spread of the disease occurs uh, one to two days into symptom, um, symptoms being present within the host. Uh, whereas you'll see the viral shedding within uh, patients with COVID-19 actually occurs prior to them having any symptoms, which is the big concern why we're seeing uh, the importance of wearing masks uh, as providers as well as out in the population because of the potential that uh, those who do not look sick are the ones that could very much uh, get us sick and get our patients sick. And then the, the last big kind of key component to understand is R0. Um, and you're seeing this R0 as a basic reproductive factor of a disease. Um, when we see influenza, your, your typical R0, meaning the typical patient that has the flu, will go on to infect somewhere between you know, one to two people. So it's typically less than two people. Whereas that R0 for COVID-19 appears to be two to two and a half. So for every patient that's infected with COVID-19, the average patient will then infect two to 2.5 more people uh, which is much higher than that with uh, influenza. When we talk about COVID-19, we've seen a lot of uh, information out there about PPE. Um, frankly, in Central Ohio, we've been blessed with, with Battelle and their innovation with uh, us being able to uh, sterilize and reuse uh, N95s within the healthcare environment. Uh, but PPE shortages are present across the country. Um, and a lot of that has to do with supplier limitations. Um, we need to make sure that all of our providers from the pre-hospital uh, care setting to hospital setting uh, do have adequate PPE as coronavirus is a, a respiratory a droplet illness. Um, there was some concern initially that it may have been airborne, uh, which is, is key to understand as we use different therapies. We wanna minimize aerosolization of droplets that may potentially uh, allow that virus to be more airborne. So that's why we're minimizing our utilization of duonabs, albuterol nebulized treatments. We wanna make sure that um, we're also minimizing our utilization of non-invasive ventil ventilation modalities such as BiPAP and CPAP. The key for uh, all of us as we use the PPE is going to be the proper donning and doffing, meaning putting it on and, and taking it off. You want to make sure that you're not potentially infecting yourself as you remove um, this, uh, whether you're removing our masks, goggles, um, or gowns, you want to make sure that you are not potentially infecting yourself in the process. So the key with that is, is also going to be hand washing, uh, which a good, uh, and a habit to get into is washing your hands before um, you remove your mask and then washing your hands after you remove your mask so that you're not infecting yourself. Um, the International Association of Firefighters currently is recommending N95 or P100s with eye protection. Um, surgical masks for patients if possible within your supply chain. Uh, gloves, hand washing, uh, as well as minimizing contact in poorly ventilated areas. So current return to work guidelines. Um, currently, um, CDC uh, recommends different return to work guideline pathways, um, whether we test or do not test. Um, if you've had a test and you tested positive, you're able to return to work uh, after you have been symptom free for at least three days without any medication, um, that you have allowed at least 10 days to pass since your symptoms first appeared. Um, and all of your symptoms have improved. If you have not had a test, um, you're able to return to work during that, that excuse me, if you've had a test, um, you can either be retested with two negative tests in a row, uh, 24 hours apart, um, as long as all of your symptoms have uh, 
resolved. And if you have not had a test, which uh, frankly in Central Ohio, our testing supply is much greater than that that's available throughout the uh, country. Um, and so those that need tests certainly should uh, have the ability to have those tests uh, here in Central Ohio. But people who did not have COVID-19 symptoms, uh, but tested positive, uh, they can uh, return to work at, well, again at that 10 day time period um, as so long as they do not have any symptoms. And this is individuals that again, did not show any symptoms at all, but did test positive. So COVID-19 testing uh, specifically for uh, first responders. Um, we can contact the Ohio Health uh, COVID-19 clinical team at a uh, number uh, and it's available uh, seven days a week uh, with different times. Um, based upon answers to a series of different questions, uh, you may be directed to a testing site. Um, and our current testing uh, strategies within uh, Ohio Health are seeing turnaround times of uh, less than a day uh, for our tests. In addition, uh, both within Ohio Health as well as within some of the private laboratories, we're seeing the ability to get antibody testing, uh, which will be testing to see if your body has in fact encountered COVID-19 and developed the ability to respond to it um, and developed antibodies. What this means long-term uh, with regard to immunity, we do not know um, because of the fact that this is what type of virus this is. And typically, I mean, you can have a cold every year. Um, and so we don't know that there will be long-standing immunity to COVID-19 with those antibodies, but it will at least provide us with some additional information as uh, this disease and pandemic unfolds. My references, I'd be happy to entertain any questions from the panel. Thanks, Ryan, that was, that was really good. Um, one question I had for you was, what do you think is gonna happen in the fall and over the course of the next 12 to 24 months in regards to the incidence and prevalence of COVID-19 is it going to be more of a slow burn? Is it going to be more of a second wave in the fall? Um, what are you doing to prepare for that from an EMS standpoint and from an ED standpoint? So uh, I think, you know, when we, we try and decide what's going to happen, you know, in the future, it is, it's a crystal ball. You know, you talk to 10 people, 10 different people have uh, uh, 10 different ideas. Um, realistically, I think we're going to see this as we're in May. Things are starting to open back up here in Ohio, and we're gonna to start to see some increased prevalence of the disease. One, because people are going back out, out into the public, and two, we're, we have much more testing availability. Um, and I think we need to prepare uh, across the healthcare system as though we are gonna see this start to increase again in the fall once people spend more time inside and not outside as much. Um, and they're more in that enclosed environment within that six foot distance um, of one another where they might be able to spread that respiratory droplet. Um, I think realistically, we'll see it gain more prevalence again in the fall when we see people in closer contact like that. Um, and so we need to make sure that we are conserving PPE, that we have those, those plans in place. And much of what we did in terms of this, this uh, isolation and the quarantine that we've seen within Ohio um, was in order to prepare as healthcare systems um, and as healthcare providers for what the future might hold. And I think, frankly, in Central Ohio, uh, between our, our healthcare systems that are here, as well as a lot of our pre-hospital providers, we, I think we've got a lot of great planning in place um, should this start to spike up. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Dr. Steyer? Dr. Squire, I had a question for you. Um, you know, certainly as uh, EMS providers, you know, being called out on a variety of 911 calls, uh, do you have any tips to figure out how to keep um, themselves safe when you're not really sure what the patient may or may not have? How do you keep that index of suspicion and what do you recommend as far as PPE strategies when, you know, our uh, paramedics and EMTs are arriving on scene to a patient? 
And great question, Brad. You know, when when we look at uh, the disease, again, I go back to that that asymptomatic period. And, and most individuals that have COVID-19, they will be most infectious during the, the time period when they don't have symptoms, that two to 14 day window. And so I, I think we need to make sure that we're exercising adequate protection uh, and barriers in place for ourselves, uh, that every, every patient may in fact uh, have um, the virus, make sure that we're getting used to that, that workflow that's standard to prevent ourselves from getting ill, as well as provide adequate care for our patients. If we're able to meet patients at the door um, when we go on a call, uh, whether it's at a nursing home or a private residence, um, many times that may be safer for the patient as well as safer for the provider than entering that enclosed environment where ventilation might not be as well as at, uh, outside. So if we're able to meet patients um, at a door, that certainly would help, um, as well as getting used to that donning and doffing um, and making sure we're, we're washing our hands and, and demonstrating adequate protection with every patient. Thank you. It sounds like it's used early and max often. Dr. Squire, would you comment a little bit on uh, post-shift routines to try and uh, make sure your providers can bring them home to their families? I'm, so, I'm sorry, Dr. Barr, I had trouble hearing your question. Can you hear me now? Yes. Could you just comment a little bit on post-shift routines to prevent the personnel from bringing it home to their loved ones and their family? Um, post-shift routines in terms of, of uh, preventing bringing it home for our loved ones. And that's, you know, that goes just as much on with um, how we make sure that we're taking care of patients and making sure that we're keeping patients safe. We need to make sure we're keeping ourselves and our loved ones safe. Um, and everyone, again, you talk to 10 different people, 10 different people have 10, 10 different strategies. I think the biggest thing is making sure you're minimizing contact without um, spreading the disease. You, I, I mean, for me in particular, um, I keep my clothing um, in my car until I have to do an entire load. Um, no one else rides in my car right now. Um, I make sure that I'm, you know, changing in, in my garage and going directly in to uh, take a shower so that I don't spread things. Um, to my family members, and I don't say hi to my family members until I've made sure I've taken adequate uh, precautions to to make sure that I myself am uh, disinfected per se, which is definitely a, a change in in workflow for me. As I my kids, even when they were babies, they would come in the house and in the door with you know scrubs on and didn't think twice. Um, and definitely, it's just you know thinking twice, getting in that routine, and just as much as you know when we go to work. Um, I, you know, I share people with people that it's a routine that they need to get into when going to the grocery store, when going out in public and understanding they could in fact be coming in contact with, you know, asymptomatic individuals and what they can do to minimize and limit that you know, spread of disease. Dr. Squire, thank you. That was a really good presentation uh, and a lot of good useful information. So thank you very much. We'll transition into our next topic, which is airway. We have Dr. Little. We'll be talking about pre oxygenation and patient positioning. I'll hand it over to you, Andy. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks, Eric and Ohio Health EMS for having me on. I, I am uh, Dr. Andy Little, current attending physician at Doctors Hospital and faculty for the EM residency there. And again, we're going to be talking about positioning and pre oxygenation. So, I usually give a ton, a ton of talks on airway for both the pre-hospital provider and the in-hospital provider. Uh, usually it was a little more extensive. So um, real quick, I have no relevant financial disclosures to, to kind of go over today other than I have a ton of debt that isn't paid off yet, but that doesn't matter to anybody. So uh, these are kind of the five things we talk about when we talk about intubation, you know, preparation, position, pre-oxygenation, pushing the meds and passing the tube. Today, we're really just going to focus on steps two and three of this five step process that I typically cover. Um, and these are really two of the more important steps uh, when we talk about pre hospital airway or just airway in general, regardless of where an airway is being done. So let's talk a little bit about position. So, you know, when we think about positioning, we've taken this patient out of their home, they're in the back of an ambulance. Um, we put them on the monitor and say, boom, they have a, a low oxygen saturation, they have increased work of breathing. What are some things that I can do to help modify? those factors. And the first thing you can do is position the patient. And so here's your typical EMS gurney. Um, it's important to realize that this can really be used as a great tool um, to help you out 
you know, when we think about positioning, a lot of times uh, it's disheartening as a as an ER physician when I see somebody with an airway problem come in line flat. And so I like the idea of using basic things to modify our workspace. If you have a gurney that for some reason is broken or can't set up, you can use things like towels or other linens to kind of raise somebody's head of the bed up. Um, it isn't really very practical in the pre-hospital setting, but might be something that you have to do, again, depending on your resources. But really, for me, it's always about bed of the head up um, and the head elevated. And so this simple position of going from flat to even as little as 15 degrees helps with alveolar recruitment, helps with the anatomy of the airway, moving their tongue, opening, um, opening their head, arching it back just enough so you can get oxygen in the right place um, rather than it just sitting in their mouth. Um, and so if you're going to think that this is somebody I need to take an airway away from, Raise the head of the bed at least to 15 degrees. There's really good literature that you can raise them as high as 45 degrees and get very, very good pre-oxygenation, maybe even delaying the need to intubate them just with the appropriate position. So when you're thinking about positioning, remember you want bed up, head elevated. Um, and then also think about other simple things like a simple jaw thrust on a patient that you can voluntarily give while providing oxygen that we're going to talk about modalities for that is another great thing you can do to help position the patient. But the key is these people should not be on their back. They should be elevated in some way, shape, or form. And then also think about as you're positioning the patient, think about how that's going to affect you, knowing that as we moved down the algorithm to airway, as you raise the head of their bed, you will have to raise yourself up higher to do that as well. So think about maybe having a stool or maybe not going to the full 45 degrees, but staying maybe at just 15. But then when we talk about pre-oxygenation, so we position the patient, we've decided this patient's going to get intubated. We've got them at least to 15 degrees. Um, if they're awake and talking, again, the, the higher you can go, the better. But we've decided to pre-oxygenate the patient. So in the pre-hospital setting, we have some really good modalities that we use in the hospital. Um, and really everything we have minus uh, a ventilator, you guys have some similar resources. So let's talk first about nasal cannula. This is the probably, in my opinion, the most underutilized way to pre-oxygenate people. It's great. It's effective. It requires one tank of oxygen, so it's a resource appropriate, regardless of the, the ambulance that you're in. Um, it's something that you can attach to an end tidal CO2 to get a waveform pretty easily. Um, and you can give them up to 20 liters via nasal cannula. I know the protocols talk about five to 10, but there have been studies that show for a short period of time, which they define as under 15 minutes, which is about the time most of you are going to take to get to an emergency department. You can put people on up to, up to 20 liters via nasal cannula. That provides them with high levels of FiO2. Um, it allows them to anatomically use their... Um, Use the, use the anatomy that they were given, which if you look at the cross-section of a head, the nose is built to deliver oxygen directly into the trachea. And so you're utilizing things that they already have, and then again, something that's very low technology. You can then add a non-rebreather on top of it. So if you have the availability of having a two oxygen tank set up, you can give some via non-rebreather, which is nice because it helps kind of um, denitrogenize their mouth makes it to where they actually have to breathe out and helps um, helps them with their CO2 exchange. And then put that on top of the, the nasal cannula and it can be a great bridge device if say you don't have something like CPAP. So a lot of things we talk about, or a lot of people talk about using a bag valve mask. My issue with a bag valve mask um, is, is that you're really forcing air typically against a patient's normal breathing pattern and you can inadvertently inflate their stomach. And so um, you can use it. It's an okay adjuvant. It's not something that I would tell you to routinely use other than using a non-rebreather and a nasal cannula first. It's great um, for that last little stage of pre-oxygenation before you intubate a patient if for some reason they're not responding and you've given your medicines. But in terms of before you push the meds, um, a bag valve mask is something that you can use, but there are other really good options. Again, the non-rebreather and the nasal cannula on high flow. And then let's talk about CPAP. Um, I love it when I see EMS come in with CPAP on. It's a great modality for the patient that is awake um, and able to follow some commands. It's great for our CHF, our CHF patients, great for our, our chronic lung patients, something you can put a blind setting of a CPAP of six to eight um, and help them, again, give oxygen um, in a forced, forced capacity, gives them a little bit of PEEP or positive, um, positive pressure to keep their lungs open between breaths. And it's something that, again, can save or stave off an intubation in the pre-hospital setting and allow that to be done in the hospital if it's needed to be done at all. Um, if we were to look at intubations years ago, there were a lot of people that we used to intubate that now can be placed on CPAP or when they're moved to the ER on a BiPAP, 
um, without having to intubate them. And so CPAP, if it is available and on your truck, is a great modality for the awake patient whose airway is compromised. And then really the key, key for me in pre-oxygenation in the pre-hospital setting is everybody should be placed on end-tidal CO2. It gives you a better tool for success to see if you're pre-oxygenating them appropriately and if your oxygenation is starting to fail. Um, study after study shows that end-tidal CO2 levels are a better um, indicator of airway failure and oxygenation failure than SpO2 alone because it can take up to 30 to 45 seconds for your SpO2 to respond to where your end-tidal might start going down sooner. And so it's a great tool, I think, to put it on with your nasal cannula and then have this kind of be your monitor that as you start to see end titles go down, you can then move up the algorithm of just, uh, just nasal cannula, maybe a non rebreather, and then adding CPAP. And regardless of how you're going to pre-oxygenate the patient, I really want to focus on the idea that nasal cannula should be there the entire time, whether they're on CPAP, whether they're on a non rebreather, and even if you choose to bag the patient, have nasal cannula with at least 10 liters going through because it's something that can stay in place while you intubate to give passive oxygenation once they've been gotten their medicine and really should be taken off only once the tube is passed. And so focus on the idea that nasal cannula needs to be part of your algorithm the entire time when you're pre-oxygenating these patients because um, it will help stave off um, uh, the apneic oxygenation that we, or the desaturation that we worry about when these patients are given, medic given medications for intubation. And so again, position, remember head up, uh, jaw, head up, Fed up, head up, um, you want to do a jaw thrust and then pre-oxygenate using the modality we talked about. And I think that's really it from a pre-oxygenation and positioning standpoint. Um, I'd love to hear other people chime in for some tips and tricks um, on what they do as well. Andy, that was great. Thank you. One question I have for you is in the apneic patient, is it reasonable to use a superglottic airway such as an IGEL or a King LT Rather than using a bag valve mask, what are some pros and cons to that approach? Uh, you're on mute, Dr. Little. Sorry, I muted myself. So um, uh, I'm a big fan of superglottic airways, whether it's a King or whether it's an iGel or combi tube or whatever your whatever your shop's using. Um, I think those are superior to using a bag valve mask because you can give targeted oxygen to the appropriate area for the patient's apneic. You know, they talk about concern for um, for aspiration and things like that by engaging the vollecula, but I think that you're safe in these patients by using a superglottic airway. And then again, that can be used by the ED providers once they're there. Um, it's not definitive, but it's a great bridge to uh, to an airway exchange. So if, if it gets to that where they're not responding to anything, I think a superglottic airway is perfect. And I think Andy had a question that you had mentioned about this passive apneic oxygenation through the nasal cannula, you know, at 10 liters or higher oftentimes. What percentage of the time or how often do you do that during the entire intubation procedure? Is that something you'd recommend? Uh, yeah, I, I think when you look at the literature, there's you know, that it should be part of your airway algorithm, whether it's in the hospital or out of the hospital. And again, like I mentioned, nasal cannula is on my patients till the tube's passed. It's always there. It's always at 10 liters or higher because um, in that pause of trying to get the anatomy right to where you can pass the tube successfully, you're, ought, you're delivering oxygen because of the way the nasal passage uh, delivers it to the trachea. So I think you're, it's a simple thing that is overlooked uh, a lot when we do airway management. I think that's a good call out. I think studies have shown several extra additional minutes for your hypoxic patient with that yeah. technique. All right, thank you, Andy. That was really great. Uh, we'll transition over to Dr. Barr now for a talk about tracheal manipulation during laryngoscopy, as well as using the bougie to help supplement your intubation attempt. Thank you, Laurel. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes. All right. Let me get my screen up here. All right, so I am Laurel Barr. Um, I am a physician with Mid-Ohio Emergency Services, and I'd just like to say thank you, ha uh, happy EMS week, and uh, thank you for all that you do this week and every week, because we really couldn't do what we do without you bringing us our sick patients. So thank you very much. And my goal for right now is gonna be to 
put some more tips or tips and tricks in the toolbox for passing that tube. We talked about pre oxygenation, we talked about leading up to it, but I really think that this is the part where um, if you have just a couple of extra trips of, uh, of tricks, it can mean the difference between um, panic and a smooth airway. Um, I'm a big fan of KISS, keep it simple, stupid. So I'm going to try and uh, simple th or, uh, smooth things up so that you know exactly what to do uh, one time. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is tracheal manipulation techniques. I've got about three and a half to go over. And like I said, I'm going to kind of dumb it down at the end so you know exactly what to do. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is tricholine pressure. So what you're going to do for this is you're going to find your Adam's apple there. That is your thyroid cartilage. Right underneath that is the cricoid cartilage. And you're going to take your fingers and push it down. And you're going to, your goal is going to be to occlude the esophagus to prevent aspiration. That's what this maneuver is supposed to do. And it does not work and it gives you a worse view of the airway. So don't do it and forget about it right now. The next one I'm going to talk about is uh, backwards, upwards, rightwards pressure, also called BERT. So in this one, you're going to take that Adam's apple or the thyroid cartilage, and you're going to press back, up, and to the right. It's your goal of bringing to drop that larynx into view so you get the great view of the cords. And this one does work pretty well. And then here's just a little review of the anatomy where the thyroid cartilage is on top, and then the cricothyroid membrane, and then the cricoid cartilage. So you want to grab that thyroid cartilage, it's the bigger one, and you want to just push it in that direction. So the next thing we're going to talk about is optimal external laryngeal manipulation, or OELM, also called bimanual laryngoscopy. This is something that you do yourself, so you don't have to remember the term to tell someone else to do it, so don't worry about that, uh, and just know how to do it. So what you're going to do in this one is when you are trying to visualize the cords and you have that suboptimal view, you have your DL in your left hand, and you're going to take your right hand and place it over the patient's trachea, and just kind of manipulate that trachea until you get the best view you can. And in this technique, you're going to do that, and then you're going to have your assistant hold it there while you take that right hand and pass the tube. Now, in the modified version, what you're going to do is before you get that great view, you're going to take your assistant's hand, put it on their trachea, and you're going to move their hand until the, the larynx comes into view, and then you're going to tell your assistant to hold it there while you pass the tube. So this one is actually shown to have the highest first pass success. So this is the one that you need to remember. So it's pretty easy. If you can't get that view, you're panicking, you don't know exactly what to do, so tell someone to put their hand over that trachea, and you guide that hand in position until you get the best view that you can, and then you can go ahead and pass the tube like a rock star. Just a couple other maneuvers that you can do if you're uh, having trouble. The jaw thrust, just like the jaw thrust chin lift when someone's choking. Uh, or to open up the airway will also help you get that view. And then just something as simple as having an assistant retract the right side of the mouth will often get you that good view that you need. So my next topic is bougie techniques. So if you've never used a bougie, this is what it looks like. It's kind of a long plastic blue thing. Um, it's one of my favorite rescue devices. Uh, so my advice to you is to use it and just become familiar with it. Uh, because it will be a little bit awkward the first time you use it. So what's really helping you about this is the two-day tip at the end is angulated. So if you have that suboptimal view that you know pretty much where you're going, uh, but you can't quite pass the tube, this has that angle so you can get it where you need to go. And then this is a picture of it, um, just to show you how it can be a little bit awkward. It's kind of top-heavy, so use it beforehand uh, so you'll get used to it. So this is when you're going to use the bougie. You don't really need it for that perfect grade one view that you see, but getting to grade 2B and grade 3 when you can't exactly see where you're going to go, but you know where it is, that's when this bougie with the Kobe tip can kind of slip right into place. So this is how you do it. Um, you take your DL just as usual, and then you load your, uh, you load your ET tube onto the bougie before you start. And then you get your view, you place the bougie in, 
And what you do is you slide that coup de tip along the rings of the trachea. You can actually feel that as it goes in. So you get the confirmation that you're in place. If you can't feel that, uh, there's another technique you can use called the hold on technique, which basically means you just advance the VG as much as you can. It should get stuck in the right main stem bronchus at about 30 centimeters, plus or minus five. So if you're not really sure exactly where you are, and you can advance that and it feels like it's going too far all the way into the stomach, you're probably not in the right place. Whereas if it gets stuck at about 30 centimeters, you know you're right, and you can go ahead and slide that, uh, that ET tube into place. So here's some tips for using it. Just like anything that's important on the first time, you're gonna be a little bit floppy, not really know what to do, so practice first. Before you start, you wanna load your ET tube on the bougie because it's really hard if you've got it on, up on the end and you, you've got it in place, but you've got to load the tube. Uh, point the tip up. That gives you the, the best placement for that tip to help you. If you have difficulty passing the tube, it often will get caught on the liner to the right. If you rotate that tube 90 degrees to the left, that helps with passing the tube. Firm your in place, feel the tracheal rings, or use the hold-up technique. And then the last tip is that it's real tempting to stop looking with DL and use two hands to load that to ET tube. But keep visualizing while you pass the tube. That helps to know that you're in place and it also helps so that the anterior airway uh, doesn't get in your way and be compressing it and get you out of the place. So I would like to share a short video that just shows what you're gonna see when, uh, when you're passing the tube with the bougie. This is just a video of the, what the intubation should look like with a bougie. You're using that coup de tip to get, get it in in the suboptimal view. Then you're passing the tube, you get stuck. Rotate that 90 degrees to the left. And then it slides right in. So with that, I'd like to open up for any questions. Thanks, Dr. Barr. That was really good. One question I have for you is the tracheal manipulation techniques using the bougie. Do you have any tips for utilizing both of those practices with direct laryngoscopy versus indirect slash video laryngoscopy? Um, is it the same technique or is there an adjustments needed for different tools that you use for laryngoscopy? You can use either of these techniques for both DL or video laryngoscopy. Um, oftentimes the video laryngoscopy helps, uh, it has a little bit more of a curvature to overcome that space. Um, so you don't have to use the tracheal manipulation as much. But if you can't get that optimal view, there's really no modifications. You can go ahead and use those and just use all those tricks at the same time. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Barr? All right, thank you very much. So I'm gonna hand the reins over to Holly Heron, our system EMS director. Uh, for the John Moore Memorial EMS Award. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Eric. Uh, on behalf of uh, Ohio Health and Ohio Health EMS, uh, we want to say uh, happy EMS week, and we're sorry not to be able to uh, be with you this year uh, to celebrate face-to-face, uh, -face, but um, we appreciate everything that you do, and we wanted to thank you uh, in a virtual way. So this year's John Moore Award, uh, if uh, you recall from our past awards uh, recipients, this is really uh, in, in honor of uh, John and his legacy. Uh, at this time, we would like to celebrate the life and legacy of one uh, EMS professional 
who was committed to patients and to his fellow EMS community. I had the pleasure of uh, flying with John for over 25 years, and he is the consummate uh, EMS professional. Uh, John served as a part-time flight paramedic and instructor at Grant Medical Center over his 25 year uh, span of uh, being an a excellent educator. He was also a firefighter, paramedic, and instructor with the Columbus Division of Fire. He dedicated to the continued success of Grant's trauma uh, program and EMS programs. I'm sad to say that we lost John when he passed away in 2010. However, we celebrate his legacy as a gifted instructor and educator and a paramedic each year with the John P. Moore Memorial EMS Award for Excellence. This award is given annually to an EMS provider whose work over the course of their career has improved the lives of others by creating a positive and long lasting impact in the EMS community as a professional. Nominees must have a demonstrated impact that represents uh, his or hers actions as an EMS advocate, educator, mentor, provider, teacher, and or leader. This award has a presentation has the opportunity to honor two outstanding members of the EMS community, both John uh, and what John uh, stood for. The nomination entries for this year's award recipient were sent to us by a member of his department and at this time, I would like to share with you who that is. Harry Epp has been an EMT for 51 years. He has been a fire instructor for 47 years and a first responder instructor for 29 years. In 1998, Riley Township was given two life squads. Harry obtained his EMT instructor certification and created the EMT continuing education program for Riley Township. He continues to oversee that program today, 22 years later. Harry is known for his strict approach to training programs. He is very passionate and is known to keep all of his materials from years past and has a library resource on hand at all times. He can tell us the history of EMS, where and why the changes occurred and made take people from past to present state. I have witnessed Harry offer exclusive one-on-one -on -one classes when individuals have fallen short on CE or are missing a particular subject to recertify. He has helped several individuals on countless occasions by keeping training records that otherwise would have been discarded. He goes above and beyond even when plenty of opportunity has been offered. In volunteer world, Sometimes it's hard to fit in all of the education with our work and our family lives. To Harry, time is no factor to make sure that the, that the instructions uh, an instructor walks away with knowledge and embedded and is embedded forever. I have never known Harry to put himself before others. He is dedicated to his duties and truly does not get the recognition and thanks that he truly deserves. Harry has been given, has given over 50 years of his life to fire and EMS service. I can't begin to imagine the changes he has witnessed, the technology he has watched evolve and the changes he has overcome. Upon reaching his 50th year of service, he told us he was going to retire. As the time came and went, he still is by our sides, making runs and training us every month. It is his life, his passion, and his reason for living. We are honored to present this year's John P. Moore Memorial Award for EMS Excellence to Harry Epp of the Riley Township Fire Department in Oxford, Ohio. Congratulations, Harry, for your service, and we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Nice job, Holly, and congratulations. Thank you to Eric, and or thank you to Harry Epp of Riley Township, Oxford, Ohio. Our pleasure to present. Back to you, Eric. Thank you, Holly. Thank All you. right. Okay, so Dr. Casey, you're up talking about STEMI mimics. I'm gonna bring up your slides here and we'll get started. 
Thanks, thanks so much. As usual, I uh, rely on Eric for the uh, backup and support. Um, I just wanted to take a uh, take a minute and thank uh, all the EMS providers. Many of you know that uh, before going to medical school, I worked as a, as a paramedic uh, and the lead of an EMS system and uh, have great respect for everything that you do. I know the, the hard work that goes on behind the scenes um, and the dedication uh, that comes from each of you and the consummate professionals you are. It's a pleasure to work with you each and every day. Um, and you really do brighten up my time in the emergency department. I think most of you know I rush to the bedside to uh, get report from you because I think it's a true honor to interact with you. And man, I would love to uh, to one of these days get a patient from uh, from Harry who just won that award. He has been an EMT longer than I've been alive, which is uh, an amazing accomplishment. Um, and he's going to continue to outpace me. It sounds like so. I better step up my game. Anyway, um, let me talk a little bit about ST elevation, but not a STEMI, and this is the revised COVID-19 edition. Um, to make it a little bit easier for everybody, because I know it's hard sometimes to see EKGs on the screen, you can find all of these EKGs on an awesome website. It's called Life in the Fast Lane. I got them all from one site to make it easy for you to find later if you want to look at something and get a little bit of, uh, of extra knowledge. So if you could flip on to the next one there, Eric. Um, so this is a question that I get sometimes. Hey, Doc, um, so I've got this patient, they've got this ST elevation, um, but I don't think they're having a STEMI, um, and, and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if I should call it or not call it or what, what should I do with that? Um, and, and the real answer is, you know, we do everything in emergency medicine, assuming it's the worst and hoping for the best, right? So um, we're going we're gonna to treat it like it's an MI until proven otherwise. But that being said, there are times when the signs and symptoms of the demographic of the patients just don't support a STEMI. Um, and so uh, you guys amaze me that you always want to know so much more than you need to um, just to, to technically do your job, right? So uh, this is for, for you folks that want to go above and beyond. So you can think about elevation and the, the words there are actually a great mnemonic to help you remember all the different uh, causes of ST segment elevation that may or may not be what you think of as a STEMI. So let's start with uh, E, if you'll flip on to the next one there. There we go. Um, e is for electrolytes, and the classic is hyperkalemia, but you may occasionally see um, uh, calcium reactions and things like that. But here, when you're taking a look at this, um, you should be noticing uh, the very uh, we talk about the hyperacute T waves, the very tall peaked T waves that you see there. Um, they're symmetric, they're big, they go across leads, but more importantly, you don't see what we look for, which is something called reciprocal changes, which is where you have ST depression or other, um, uh, other evidence of an infarction going on other leads. And the other thing that's interesting about this is you kind of got this some widened out QRS complex, and we would call this um, a uh, nonspecific interventricular conduction delay, or an IVCD. And what that basically means is the QRS is wider than we think it should be, but it doesn't follow that typical left bundle branch pattern or that right bundle branch pattern that we would normally like to see. So what we typically do in medicine is when it doesn't fit into a pattern, we give it a third name, usually idiopathic or something like that, and that's what this is, right? It's, it's wide, but we don't know why. And so this would be a great example of hyperkalemia. You'd be really worried about this patient going into, into VFEB or VTAC. So this is one where aggressive treatment is what's going to guide it rather than what the actual number is. So we've got our E down. Let's move on to L. And uh, uh, L is for the left bundle branch block, which I just previously mentioned uh, following, uh, you know, kind of uh, in, in the pattern that we look for. The, the interesting thing with left bundle branch block was for a time it was considered to be a STEMI equivalent if you didn't have proof that someone had had a left ventricular or a left bundle branch block before and they have one now, um, it was considered a STEMI equivalent. But really for STEMI, um, even though there's a rush to get people to the cath lab, we're, we're realizing more and more that um, STEMI is really a constellation of symptoms. And so in a left bundle branch block, what you've got is a delayed morphology. And you could see this, for example, with a person that had a ventricular pacemaker. You're going to see the same morphology. And because of the altered way that the electricity is flowing through, you typically are going to see ST elevation on the CKG. Um, uh, you could see it in like V2, V3, V4. Um, you can see that ST elevation there. 
Um, but uh, one of the things you may hear tossed around are Scarbosa criteria, which is something that you're more than welcome to, to look up because it takes a little bit of time to learn that. But Scarbosa criteria is a, is a pretty good way to help uh, define that. Do you need to know that in the back of the rig? No, but if you have somebody who's presenting um, with no STEMI symptoms, but you've got an EKG on them and this comes up, um, that would be something that I would consider uh, looking at and not necessarily activating a STEMI alert on, but rather just letting the hospital know that they've got ST elevation and let them make that determination. Um, next up, we have another E, um, which is one that you hear tossed around a lot. It was historically associated with uh, what we thought were young athletes, but uh, there's been a fair amount of research to show that this can occur at any age, and that's early repolarization. Um, if, uh, if you look particularly um, there in V5 uh, and V6, you can see it pretty well. Um, you can also see it in uh, lead three there and the AVF, but there's kind of a notch there at the end of that downgoing R wave, and it's leading to some ST elevation, but really what it is is it's a J wave that's causing that. Um, so what you're seeing is the J wave, um, sticking out there, uh, and that is what's causing, thanks uh, for highlighting that, um, that J wave is what's causing that appearance, that ST elevation. Um, so when you take a look at it, you still see that it's got kind of the, the concave view there um, where it's uh, looking up and it's looking like a big smiley face there. So um, you may see this on patients when you, uh, when you put that uh, EKG on them, but early repoll. Um, the significance of it clinically hasn't really been determined. We don't think it's a super dangerous thing, but it's just something to be aware of uh, that patients may have. Um, so we've gone through E, L, and E. So up next, um, we should have V, which is ventricular hypertrophy. And this is just caused by enlargement of the ventricle. And so remember the EKG is an electrical tracing of what's going on mechanically in the heart. Those are two separate things. So if you mechanically alter the shape of the heart, you can get EKG changes. And this is a classic um, ventricular pattern that you would see with that, right? So you're gonna get some stretching out of the QRS duration. It's gonna be a little bit higher. Um, you are going to see um, uh, a couple of different things, but the thing that I'd like to really point out is if you look at V1, there's this super, super deep S wave and that's really a hint that we use to help differentiate left ventricular hypertrophy from other things. We call it a, uh, a strain type pattern. So you look at that big S wave in V1, and you look in V5 and V6, and you see that huge uh, R wave. If you put those together, they're greater than 35 millimeters uh, in height, which is a rule that we use to help determine this indicates a strain pattern. Um, so what you're seeing there is that elevation. Uh, but it's not actually recognizing, or it's not actually being caused by a, um, by a thrombus or some type of actual uh, cardiac injury. It's just caused by cardiac disease in general where the left ventricle pattern is, uh, is strained out. So there's your V. Let's move on to the next one, uh, A, which is an aneurysm. Um, you'll see an aneurysm uh, most commonly after someone's had an MI. Uh, in the past, and that area will um, weaken, as we talk about a lot of times, and the heart will actually balloon out. Usually you start to see it's about four to six weeks after an MI. And so some of the clues that this might be what's going on is if you look in V1 through really V4, you see these deep dagger-like Q waves. Those are indicative of an old infarct. And then the ST elevation there is just persistent. It can, it can persist for months or even years. And this can be a cause of frustration for a patient um, we had a, a patient that was brought in that had a language barrier and all they had was the EKG. So we sent him to the cath lab and after uh, he was under the needle, so to speak, we realized that he'd been cathed a month before an intervention had been done, right? So not that anything was necessarily done wrong, it was just less than optimal. So we, we gave this guy a copy of his EKG and he started carrying it around with him. And he couldn't, he couldn't speak the uh, language, but he would hold up his EKG and it had on the front, the EKG on the back, it said, this is old. Um, so uh, people tended to get that and it worked out really well. So sometimes we have to come up with innovation solutions for our EMS patients. Um, so you can also see this interesting with the disease called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, the broken heart syndrome, which is a ballooning out of the apex that's unrelated to previous heart disease. Uh, and uh, if you thought the broken heart was not a real thing, it really is. It's a really interesting disease to look up. So there's elevation, there's the A. So let's move on to the next one, which is T. 
Um, we had to make it fit because Brugada didn't fit anywhere else and we needed a T. But the good news is Brugada, Brugada syndrome was first recognized in Thailand. Um, there's a difference between a Brugada EKG and a Brugada syndrome, and I just wanted to point that out. Just because somebody has a nasty-looking EKG like this doesn't mean that they have Brugada syndrome. They, they're called Brugada complexes. Brugada syndrome is when they have this nasty-looking EKG plus symptoms like chest pain, shortness of breath, diaphoresis, generally don't feel well, that kind of thing. But the, the quick point is um, to update some of you really smart medics that already know all of this. Uh, we did, we in the past talked about three types of Brugada, but there are really now only two. Um, the third type got dropped because it wasn't really Brugada. Um, type 1 and type 2, really the way you differentiate and see these is you look in uh, V1 and V2. The, the coved um, type is basically um, the one that kind of starts up and kind of roundly slopes down in that S elevation. And the saddleback has this uh, two peak with kind of a, a trough in the middle. Uh, interestingly, that terminology comes from roofing. A coved roof is one that the roof slopes down into the wall, and that's what it looks like. And a saddleback roof is one where the roof is peaked on both sides but drags in the middle, and that's what you're looking at there. If you see this pattern in somebody that's having um, chest pain, shortness of breath, acutely ill, that would be considered a STEMI equivalent, um, but not necessarily a STEMI, interestingly enough. Um, so there's a elevation, the T, so let's move on to the next one. Um, so I can keep you guys on track. The I is for inflammation. This is probably one of the ones most known to people, but pericarditis, which is basically diffuse ST elevation without any reciprocal changes, usually in an otherwise um, healthy person, maybe they've had a cold recently, usually complain of some chest pain uh, that may change with position. Um, but usually this is a younger type person, not super sick looking. If they are a little bit sicker, you can get this change with the infection of myocarditis as well. Um, but it will usually look worse and they will be sicker, but still doesn't necessarily indicate that they have a STEMI, um, but they do have that ST elevation that you can see. So. There's your, uh, there's your I in elevation. Up next, and uh, moving toward the end, is the O, the Osborne waves. We think about this with hypothermia. Again, we've got that J wave there that uh, Dr. Cortez was kind enough to point out earlier. Um, and that J wave is really, really uh, important in differentiating this. So the, the hint for this one is that the person is cold. That seems like it's really obvious, but I will tell you, you can get fooled really, really easily. Um, just within the past month, I've had an EMS crew that brought in uh, somebody um, and they, they were altered, and uh, it turns out that they were hypothermic. Um, and the problem is it was cold outside, everybody had gear on, everybody had COVID gear on, um, and so if, you know, they, no one had really laid a hand on the patient, uh, you know, enough to kind of get their temperature and stuff. Uh, and, um, and so uh, Osborne waves like this will manifest. It's not true ST elevation, we call that G point. Um, or J-wave elevation. So um, that's the O and then the N. Uh, up next and final there is the non-ischemic vasospasm. You may have heard it called principal angina in the past. You can also see this with cocaine, which the problem with cocaine uh, chest pain is that it induces vasospasm, much like uh, what used to be called principals. If you looked at the CKG in the field and did not call a STEMI, um, we would not really, really be pleased because all of the emergency physicians out here would call a STEMI based on this as well. Um, there's really no good way to differentiate that this is a STEMI or not a STEMI um, until they've actually had some treatment. Um, so uh, if you gave someone a dose or two of nitroglycerin and all these ST segment problems went away and everything was normalized and the patient was absolutely pain free, then you would start to let that creep into your differential. So you may see that in the field sometimes, and that's why it's so important that you bring those initial EKGs with you and give us a copy, um, particularly if you think they had ST elevation before, because that can help us differentiate and make a decision about whether the person really needs to go to the cath lab or not. And so with that, on to the uh, uh, last thing. Since we were talking about electricity, I thought I would throw a little physics. Just remember EMS, you guys matter. But if you just multiply yourself by the sea light squared, then you energy, not you matter. Just thought I'd point that out. And uh, with that, if you guys have any questions, if not, uh, we can move along. Thanks. Hey, Dr. Casey, I wasn't uh, sure if you had heard anything related to COVID and STEMI um, and mix. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of interesting chatter going on about COVID and STEMI. Um, particularly because uh, there is some evidence that suggests that COVID puts you into a, 
uh, three pre-thrombotic state. Um, and so treatment-wise, um, I think most people now that are going to a cath lab are getting COVID um, evaluation uh, as well. Um, I have not seen huge numbers yet. Typically, the people that are having MIs are just having MIs. Unfortunately, a lot of them are waiting a long time to come in. Um, but there is some good research that is being looked at in Baltimore and a few other places to see if there is a, is a true association uh, between COVID um, and cardiovascular disease. Interestingly enough, there is some association that they're starting to look at. Some numbers are coming out about testicular uh, torsion and whether or not there's actually um, clotting that's actually causing that. So um, PE, uh, thrombotic clots, uh, testicular torsion, all those things are potentially linked and the science is still up. So it may be different in a week when you guys are actually seeing that. So stay tuned. Great question, Dr. Schneider. Great job, John. Are, do we have any other questions for Dr. Casey? All right. Thanks again. So, Dr. Snyder, we'll move on to you with thrombectomy in strokes. All right. Can you hear and see? Yes. All right. So, um, my topic was uh, keeping your thumb on thrombectomy. And uh, I know this is a kind of a vast topic, but I thought it'd be helpful to talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of what thrombectomy is, uh, how it relates to the EMS world and pre-hospital care. And uh, again, I want to echo my sentiment for the rest of the ED physicians here, um, how much we appreciate the pre-hospital um, providers that uh, are listening today and in general. So uh, we thought we'd uh, sort of navigate the importance of uh, pre-hospital care as well, hopefully not to fall asleep and uh, no care tease on number three there. Um, just a little disclaimer, I do have one. I am definitely not a neurointensivist uh, or a neurointerventionalist or a neurologist or a neuroradiologist, just a, just a friendly ER doc if you want to um, supplement the F there. Um, but uh, just going to give you sort of our insight uh, as I feel like pre-hospital venue and the ED are kind of on the same team on this. So firstly, uh, what is a thrombectomy? So um, basically think of it as a, as a cardiac cath for your brain. A uh, patient is taken to an IR lab and, and catheterized similarly to a cardiac cath and a clot is removed. Um, you may have heard of older generation stent retrievers like uh, the Mercy Retriever. We're into a little bit uh, newer strength, uh, stent retrievers like Solitaire and Trevo. There's also some aspiration devices you may uh, hear about. So sort of the general idea, um, a neurointerventionalist uh, would, would cast a patient of sorts. They'd stick a wire through uh, an artery in their brain. They'd look uh, for a clot, grab it with a little basket, and pull it out. And the goal is to recannulize a vessel that would cause a stroke. So let's just kind of get our brains warmed up of sorts and pretend you're on a run, a 52-year-old gentleman uh, getting called for has right-sided hemiparesis, um, aphasia, facial droop. They're looking to the left. Uh, the LAM score is 5. NIH, if you heard of that, is 18. And the last known well is 13 hours ago. So what do we do? So firstly, um, I kind of think, could this patient benefit from anything, and could they benefit from a thrombectomy? So there's... Um, a lot of literature that has evolved in the last maybe five to ten years uh, uh, as far as the thrombectomy, the older devices were not as great. But in 2015, sort of had the slew of new literature, Mr. Clean, Extend IA Escape. Uh, Mr. Clean was sort of the big one. It's 500 patients and, and uh, looked within about six hours of last known well uh, as far as thrombectomy. And actually, number to treat. So how many people do you treat to have benefit seven for Mr. Clean? Did not show any difference in mortality or intracranial hemorrhage, but boy, it started to get the juices running. And then Extend and Escape came out pretty much the same time, um, much less volume of patients, but number needed to treat three for, for Extend, uh, four for Escape for functional benefit. And that basically means how they're going to do in, in uh, a couple months' time as far as their functional independence. Uh, the thing about Escape that was a little different, did have the mortality benefit, um, and that was uh, patients up to 12 hours, but Extend was only up to six hours from last known well. Uh, Swift Prime and Revascat, um, six hours for Swift Prime as well. Um, number needed to treat for these are four to three to six for functional independence. Uh, the problem is our patient, last known well is 13 hours ago. So, boy, does this person have anything that we can do for them? So, you may have heard of a few studies that came out in the last few years. Don and Diffuse 3 are big ones. Don, sort of the big one that's really got our interventionalists uh, excited. It's about 200 patients, 
And they've actually looked at last known wells six hours to 24 hours after last known well. Um, all of these studies, really, they're looking at proximal clots. Is there a big clot in the, in the beginning part of an artery that's going to cause a huge area of, of lack of blood flow in the brain? And they found, Don, that actually up to 24 hours, you can have an unrelated treat of three. So three people treated have a benefit. Um, just sort of comparing that to other uh, modalities we do in medicine, that's pretty fantastic. Um, no difference in mortality and no difference in uh, bleeding in your brain. Uh, Diffuse 3, very similar trial to Don. Um, they did six hours to 16 hours, about, about 200 patients as well. Um, similar type of uh, outcome as Don. Um, one thing that's a little limitating, uh, limitations is there's, there's small volume of patients in these trials, and they did stop them early as there was benefit. Uh, but boy, it's definitely something that started the juices running. Um, so I thought we'd talk a little bit about how do we know uh, a little bit more about does this person person have um, a penumbra, a salvageable part of their brain. So there's a modality we talk about uh, at various hospitals called CT perfusion. And it basically looks like uh, looks a little bit like this on their brain scan. There's a blue dot and a red dot. Blue dot is an area of uh, dead tissue. Red is basically um, ischemic tissue or at-risk tissue. And if there's a small little area of dead tissue and a large area of salvageable tissue, we call that mismatch and they can go get a thrombectomy. Second one, if they match, they're matched and there's a pretty large area of dead tissue and a tissue that's at risk, not a whole lot of benefit. And the last one, they're brain dead. There's, there's not a whole lot of tissue left on either side. So I thought we'd get some colorful pictures here just not to get people asleep. So this is a little bit what we see in the hospital. Um, and this gives you a little bit of credence of what you guys do is so important, getting them quickly um, uh, taken to the hospital and, and appropriately um, triaged from a pre-hospital world. So CBV is, is what we're looking at in the, in the second slide there. Little area right in the middle, very dark purple, that's dead tissue. PTP is time to peak and MTT on the bottom is basically how much brain is, is salvageable. That big red area, that's our penumbra. And if you think about that, patient can do really well. This is actually the patient we talked about earlier with our LAM score of five and uh, dense hemiparesis, NIH was so high. This person, different case, um, huge dark area there on the second slide, CBV big area of dead tissue. This is matched to an area of, of ischemic tissue, and honestly, this person wouldn't do so well with IR. Just to give you another example, large areas of dark blue, CBV, big areas of necrosis and infarct. The rest of the matched areas are basically the same. That person honestly doesn't have much living brain. So how do we kind of put all, all of the thoughts of what imaging to do, where to take them, what do we do pre-hospital? Well, there's actually a guideline from the AHA and ASA just came out last year, uh, and it's very thorough. I would say uh, it takes hours to get through this on a, on a lecture, but if you're interested, it's, it's published online, very helpful. Um, but they do actually have a little bit of guidelines for what we can do pre-hospital. Um, so some, um, some uh, departments may have different stroke assessment tools. They don't actually encourage one specific one, um, but they do encourage that you do utilize something, whether that's Cincy or LAMS um, or FAST, something to um, standardize your pre-hospital uh, evaluation of a stroke patient. Um, if you think about the sensitivity and specificity of these exams, they're all pretty similar and not bad. Um, as long as you're standardizing, standardizing some assessment tool, um, they, they say that's of benefit. Uh, they also recommend pre-hospital notification to receiving hospital stroke and last known well. I know this is really um, something that gives people a little bit of anxiety as well. I promise you, um, overcall rather than undercall. We'd much rather have all of our resources ready for a possible stroke patient than not. Uh, last known well really helps us to determine if they're a TPA candidate, or in this case, even an intervention candidate. So where to go? Um, they tell you to go to a, a, a facility that's uh, capable of giving TPA, and uh, most places in Ohio are um, available for TPA, for giving TPA, and they have some stroke network uh, to facilitate that. Um, they do say that it's uncertain if bringing straight to a thrombectomy center is beneficial if you're in a TPA window. Um, but they do mention if a patient is in, 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 ineligible for lytics, um, that uh, if there's a protocol or procedure that's been developed, that's reasonable to take them straight to the thrombectomy center outside of the TPA window. Uh, one little note, too, and I'll wrap it up, is that uh, if you do get TPA, they still can get thrombectomy. And in fact, it might actually make thrombectomy a little bit easier, uh, just to FYI. Uh, as far as the AHA, ASA guidance, they also recommend point-of-care glucose. Um, they do recommend... Um, a lack of oxygen if, if need be actually. So supplemental oxygen only to maintain 94%. So if they're 
not hypoxemic, they don't need oxygen, and especially in stroke care, that might actually worsen them to give them supplemental oxygen if they don't need it. Uh, blood pressure management, let it ride. Um, it might need to get lower if they get thrown back from your TPA, but you can let it ride pre-hospital. Head of bed, uh, zero to 30 degrees, uncertain. It, it definitely doesn't um, have a huge wealth of, uh, of uh, importance in the literature, but certainly something you can consider. Uh, and in general, um, just uh, do what you keep on doing. Um, so this patient came in by medics. Um, he went uh, straight to the CT scanner. He had that first CT that we saw. Uh, he got TPA, excuse me, he did not get TPA because he's outside the window, but went to thrombectomy. And four days out, uh, he actually walked out of the hospital. His NIH score was zero, and he had a modified ranking score of one, which um, uh, basically um, he's functionally independent. So, uh, again, I appreciate all that you guys do. Um, you guys are the front line, front line of these um, stroke patients, and you, you definitely are certainly um, appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Schneider. Do we have any questions for Danny? Danny, I was going to ask you just to briefly comment on posterior strokes versus anterior strokes and how that may change pre-hospital assessment uh, and in-hospital management. Yeah, I will tell you, if you haven't missed a posterior stroke, you haven't been practicing long enough. <laughs> Um, they will fool you, and sometimes um, you, uh, you think you have it until you don't. So one thing is uh, be careful of elderly patients. They're put on this planet just to fool you as well. So nausea, vomiting, dizziness, um, imbalance um, can certainly present as a posterior stroke, and they're oftentimes missed and actually have a higher morbidity because of delayed care. So I would tell you um, uh, that um, not everything has a, a focal deficit, so they may not have a right-sided uh, weakness of their arm and leg, they might just be off balance and dizzy and nauseated. So if they're in the window, um, if they're uh, um, in the window of uh, thrombectomy, I would say it's worth coming to the hospital. Well, granted, typically thrombectomy is not um, a robust with posterior strokes. It tends to be MCA and ACA, but, um, but there's um, certainly things we can do for them in the hospital and we can get them treated quicker. So I would say anyone in the window that's um, having dizziness, off balance, nausea, and vomiting, at least consider posterior stroke. Thank you very much. All right, so we'll move on to the award announcement for the EMS Medical Director Award. Um, as we all know, the EMS Medical Director serves a critical role in the delivery of emergency medical services. To recognize EMS Medical Directors, Ohio Health is proud to present the Ohio Health Excellence in EMS Medical Direction Award. This prestigious award is bestowed annually upon an Ohio EMS Medical Director. The nomination entry for this year's award recipient was made by Chief Chad Noggle of the Harrison Township Fire Department. I would like to share some of the nomination with you. Danny serves as a teacher and expert to all of us at the Harrison Township Fire Department in Pickaway County. Not only does he work with us, but he is also acts as the EMS Medical Director for most EMS agencies in the county, Pickaway County Sheriff's Office Communication Center, and the Circleville Police Communication Center. He's not just our Medical Director, but he is one of us. Whether looking over our EMS runs to ensure we've provided the best possible care, or teaching us the latest medical information, Danny's dedication is to quality patient care. He is actively involved with members of the department and works to keep us up to date on everything. During this pandemic, Danny has gone above and beyond in helping us stay safe and prepared while we care for our community. We appreciate all that he does for us. We are honored to present this year's Ohio Health Excellence and EMS Medical Direction Award to Dr. Danny Snyder. Congratulations, Danny, and thank you for all that you do very well deserved. How about a round of applause? Not sure where that joker is, but I appreciate it. <laughs> Based on your presentation, it's very much deserved. That was excellent. Thank you very much. All right, Danny, thank you. Congratulations. Um, all right, so we'll move on to our next topic, and we have Dr. Brad Ratsky, who will be discussing interfacility ventilator strategies. Thanks, Brad. 
All right, thank you very much. Let me try to get my slideshow up here. Can you see that okay? Yes. All right, I wanna give congratulations to my colleague, uh, Danny Schneider, well-deserved. I wanna thank everybody uh, out in the audience listening to us. Uh, happy EMS week. Sorry, we're not doing this in person, uh, but as we all do in emergency medicine, we kind of take what's given at us and we roll with it and move on. So thank you for being the frontline uh, workers. I know your job's hard and even harder now that we're all wearing respirators and gowns and garb and, and worrying about safety, but we appreciate it. You're definitely a, a valued partner of our team. So um, I'm an emergency physician. I practice with a group called Mid-Ohio Emergency Services. I'm the assistant medical director uh, for emergency services of Riverside Hospital. and Also the uh, medical director for several uh, air, ground, and uh, township fire departments. So thank you for having me. Um, Pretty complex topic talking about ventilation strategies. Um, I'm kind of try to provide a good review packages and a really good nugget of information here in about 10 minutes. Try not to overwhelm, but make sure we have some good takeaways. So um, the big picture, this is the four things I want you to walk away from. So we're pretty much uh, giving you what you need in, in the first slide here. So big picture, um, we're looking for goal uh, SpO2 of 92 to 96% in our ventilated patients. We're looking for low tidal volumes. So uh, this is helping with uh, protective strategies. And we want to make sure our plateau pressures are below 30. And then um, we do uh, want to be careful when using high peak pressures for barotrauma. Um, and so what we'll do uh, is we'll kind of go through this uh, a little bit more detail. These are all um, class one recommendations by the Society of Critical Care Medicine uh, and specifically related to COVID-19. So um, our goal is to transport our patients safely and effectively, um, like I said, to give appropriate oxygenation, to help with ventilation. And remember, ventilation is really all about gash exchange uh, moving through. So while the focus is on a uh, intubated and ventilated patient, um, I do want everybody to keep in mind that all of our patients are ventilating, hopefully, uh, and providing gas exchange. So we wanna make sure that whatever method we're using, whether it's CPAP, whether it's the patient's normal breathing rate, um, we are monitoring that with end tidal CO2 to make sure that we are ventilating appropriately. And we wanna minimize damage to the lungs. Um, these are our main goals while transporting. So like I said, these are general strategies, but we are gonna kinda of give a small twist as all of our lectures are uh, regards to COVID-19. So a quick review of our ventilation strategies. Basically, all of these vent settings that we have and see and use are uh, talking about three different breaths that we can give. And so all of these strategies, whether it's assist control um, or SIMV or IMV, are really just different variations of what is being used. So the best diagram I can come up with is kind of relating this to uh, what are our breaths and how are they like a pull-up? And so, uh, you know, the first one is where we control the breath. The patient is doing no work. The ventilator is doing all of the work. So essentially without the ventilator doing anything, there'd be no gas exchange and no breathing. The second kind is called an assisted breath. So the patient's going to start working or start the pull-up, but the ventilator is really going to give the push to help them over the edge and to complete an appropriate breath. And then there's what's called a supported breath where the patient is able to do some or most of the work uh, and we just need to provide a little bit of extra to help finish to get an appropriate full breath. So these are the three different kinds of breath that you'll have in any different one of our modes that we can select. And when we talk about supporting, you can support by giving a set volume or you can support it by giving a set pressure. So those are the two things that we wanna think about there. So uh, a couple different uh, modes that you're gonna see most often are called volume limited. So we're focused on how much volume we're delivering. So the first and probably most common in our critically ill patients is called assist control. In this setting, we were gonna set the respiratory rate and tidal volume to appropriately give an appropriate minute volume. Every time a breath is taken, they get a set volume, whether it's the patient spontaneously taking a breath the ventilator is going to make sure that they get the full tidal volume that we have set. Or if there's no spontaneous breathing, it's going to deliver that based on a set rate that we have put in the machine. Um, 
The next two are, are two different variations, and it's called uh, intermittent mandatory uh, ventilation or synchronized intermittent um, ventilation. Basically, you set a uh, underlying rate, um, but the patient can take spontaneous breaths in between our set rate, and these will have the patient do some of the work, but you'll not give a full volume each breath. So here are two diagrams on the right to illustrate the difference between that. So some of the advantages of the SIMV uh, is that the patient works with the vent and the small breaths are not uh, delivered uh, as a full breath and causing what we call a dyssynchrony in which the patient is not breathing well with the vent. It allows for lower airway pressures, more control over our support, um, and we think it helps preserve some respiratory muscle function because in between the breaths, the patient is having to do some work um, while they're taking their own breaths. Um, and our assist control is for a constant tidal volume to give maximal ventilatory support that is best used in critical patients. So instead of controlling volume, we can also control pressure, and this is called pressure support. You're going to see this less, um, and what it does is you set a pressure support level that the patient is going to need. So you're going to set your PEEP, and you're going to set the uh, oxygen setting of uh, what's being delivered. But the respiratory rate um, and tidal volume and minute ventilation is all gonna be controlled by the patient. So this a lot of times is used when we're trying to figure out how much is the patient able to do on their own before we are extubating the patient. So because the patient is essentially doing all the work except for some additional pressure we're giving, so helping with that push up, um, we think that it's a little bit more comfortable and there's some early thought that this could support weaning from the vent, um, but that's a little bit uh, not flushed out yet. So if you look here, uh, it's that middle column of pressure supported. It's what the patient is doing, and it kind of gives us an idea of how much they can do unassisted. So as you probably heard, um, and like I said, this is a topic that we could talk on for hours, it's alphabet soup. Basically, you can see that we spell help. <laughs> um, so CPAP is pretty familiar. Um, the bi-level pressure, so BiPAP, uh, is pretty familiar to a lot of us. And then there's a whole lot of other ones, such APRV, which is a, also a bi-level, high frequency, uh, and a couple others that we won't see very often in the interfacility transfer. So that's kind of a quick re review of some of our uh, settings. Um, again, we're trying to look for low tidal volume. So especially in COVID, it's a ARDS-like um, process, and so we're trying to minimize how much damage we're doing to the lungs. We found over the years there's multiple studies to support low tidal volumes, um, usually at six milliliters per kilo. Um, when you're picking up a patient, you're going to notice that this is already going to be pre-calculated and pre-set for you. Sometimes during longer transfers or including air transfers, you may have to make adjustments. Um, so most people have tables. I don't want you to memorize this formula. I certainly don't. But we're looking really between four and six milliliters a kilogram, which is much less than we used to 10, 15 years ago when we were setting eight to 10 milliliters a kilogram. So um, you also want to set when your initial settings to make sure that your rate is matching the patient's uh, rate um, at baseline. So um, even though we know this is a protective strategy, there are a couple issues associated with it that you need to be aware of is that this can cause elevated um, CO2 levels. Um, we think that this is actually okay and some mild increase of end tidal CO2 or on your uh, ABG is okay. Um, like I said, for mild, but we want to make sure that if we see this increasing um, that you need to look at how do you increase either your respiratory rate or tidal volume to improve that. Uh, we know that uh, with this low tidal volume, sometimes the patient is not going to breathe um, well along with the vent. Um, they're going to be a little bit out of rhythm. So uh, especially in coronavirus patients, we do need to probably increase our level of sedation. This can happen up to a quarter of patients. And then you can get breath stacking with this as well. Um, again, this can help with uh, sedation or change in your respiratory rate times. Um, the one thing we talked about was plateau pressures. Uh, we want to keep these below 30, uh, which will indicate um, that your pressure is not uh, damaging the lungs. 
The easiest way to do that is on your vent to hit the inspiratory hold button, and then you can read the value um, on your specific monitor. This is what it looks like in the hospital typically once you've taken a full insp inspiration. Take a hold for a second or three, and then you can get the uh, pressure. Kind of switching gears to everybody's mind is this COVID-19. Um, you know, the primary dysfunction we see is hypoxia. It's not so much ventilation. Um, so our goal, remember, is not 100%, it's 92 to 96. Um, we have found there is a good subset of patients called the happy hypoxic patients. I've definitely had several of these where they can be profoundly hypoxic in the 50s uh, and still not have any shortness of breath. Again, if their mental status and work of breathing is not severe, you can usually treat this with nasal cannula. Just be careful, some of these will crash fast. Um, especially in uh, COVID, we want to minimize any aerosolization procedures, so avoid NEBS at all costs. If you have to, then consider alternative ways, such as doing it outside the ambulance before uh, transport. Um, we want to do most of our oxygen um, in a stepwise fashion, so nasal cannula to a non-rebreather to high-flow nasal cannula. Um, so there is a little bit of a paradox where I think they do pretty well with this non-invasive ventilation, so CPAP and BiPAP. However, a lot of our recommendations have avoided this due to the risk of aerosolization. So work with your health systems, the sending and receiving facility to kind of coordinate the risk benefit um, for each specific patient. Um, so again, they developed this ARDS picture, which is uh, increasing fluid in the lungs, um, difficult to ventilate. The one difference, and we are calling this pseudo ARDS, is that their compliance is still appropriate, um, which is different than a typical ARDS picture. So we actually can use pretty high PEEP pressures and uh, not worry about um, the elevated plateau pressure. So you'll see a lot of these patients with coronavirus have high PEEP pressures in the 10 to 15 um, range to provide appropriate oxygenation. Again, that's the primary dysfunction is this hypoxia. So additional therapies that we're not going to see a lot of times, but you may see patients in a prone position, usually not transported in this position. Um, you'll see long-term paralytics. You'll see inhaled vasodilators such as nitric oxide, or people may be on ECMO in the end stage. So again, these are pretty aggressive therapies, um, but uh, just to kind of keep an idea of the wide range from a little bit of oxygen support all the way up through ECMO. And again, we're kind of starting at the... Uh, Beginning again here, saying the big picture, here are the things you need to take away. Keep in oxygen between 92 and 96%. We want to shoot for low tidal volumes. We want to keep our plateau pressures under 30 centimeters of uh, water. Um, while we are going to be using high peak pressures in these uh, COVID patients, uh, we want to make sure that we're not causing barotrauma. So again, it's, you will need to check your plateau pressures uh, during transport. Again, I want everybody to stay safe. Thank you for everything that you do. Remember, use your PPE. Here's a great slide from the uh, Department of Health in Ohio. So if you have a COVID-19 patient confirmed or suspected, make sure you're wearing an N95 uh, eye protection, gown, and gloves, especially when you're in the closed confines of our aircraft or uh, EMS units. And with that, if there are any questions, if people hopefully are still awake, I know that's a lot of ventilatory strategy, but I wanted to get everything in in 10 minutes. Back to you, Eric. Thanks, Brad. That was great. I had a question for you, um, especially in the setting of, of COVID-19. What are your thoughts on maintaining the ventilator during chest compressions? So if you have a patient that's being ventilated and they go into cardiac arrest, do you take them off and bag, or do you keep them on a ventilator? Yeah, definitely a good question. I'd be interested to see what the rest of the group is thinking about this. Um, definitely, you know, positives and negatives to both. Um, a, you want to make sure that you're not aerosolizing a lot of the COVID. So whatever you do, you want to make sure that you have a viral media filter on it. So rest of the group, what have you guys been doing in your cardiac arrest? Have you been bagging? Have you been doing vent strategy, keeping them on? Nothing. I'd say the key, the key there, Brad, is is the idea of having that viral filter on, which a lot of the ventilators will 
um, allow utilization of just because we want to do everything we can to prevent that aerosolization of the particles. So if we can have the viral filter on, that's the key. Absolutely. I agree with both of you. I think using the filter in line with whatever, whether it's a bag or a ventilator would be the key piece of that. Correct. And just make sure that not all bag valve masks do have the uh, viral filter. So discuss with your uh, medical director which kind you have to make sure that you are using the appropriate bag. Ms. Brad? Any Dr. other questions? I had a question for you. Yeah. Uh, would you mind just going over some tips if you have um, a, if the patient keeps crashing despite ventilation, do you have a go-to setting or any trip, uh, quick tips for the vent? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you have a patient who's definitely crashing, I mean, you kind of want to take it back to the beginning and say, okay, um, kind of what's going on here? So I start with my airway, just the ABC. So is our ET tube, is it kinked? Is it looking okay? Are we getting good condensation? Um, is the patient clamping down on the tube? So do we need more sedation and paralytics um, with this? Remember, you always want to sedate the patient before you provide additional paralytics. Um, as far as typical vent settings, I mean, the crashing patient, you're going to want to go to um, as much support as you can get. So that would be your assist control mode um, and redo your calculations, making sure that you're given appropriate minute ventilation, 100% FiO2, um, increase the PEEP, you know, and again, re-monitor your end tidal CO2 and your uh, pulse ox. It should guide you to a little bit better support. All right, thank you. Dr. Raski. Yes. I, have a, I just had a question. Uh, I was wondering if you would just quickly refresh uh, everyone on what uh, a breath stacking definition is and then what the definite of ARDS is, just for familiarity for our viewers. Yeah, absolutely. So ARDS is acute respiratory distress syndrome, and basically it's um, a condition in which your lungs become less compliant. Um, and our current treatment right now is um, high respiratory rates and low volume. So you're gonna see respiratory rates in the mid 20s and low volume, which is different than our usual setting. And typically when you put somebody on a vent, you're talking a respiratory rate of 12 to 16. So a lot of times you can even get up into the, almost doubling that. Um, and so breast stacking is when you're actually taking a next breath too soon. And you're not able to get your expiratory time to let the, uh, pressures decrease. So sometimes um, if the patient is breathing too quickly after the vent, you'll get the breath stacking. So methods to improve that are increased sedation. Um, you can also adjust your inspiratory and expiratory time to give a little bit longer expiratory phase or switch modes to a little bit more of an SIMV mode, um, in which case you can let the patient do a little bit less work and not get that full volume like you would in the assist control mode. Thank you for the clarification. Appreciate it. Thanks, Holly. That was a really good question. All right, so we're going to move on to our next uh, topic, which is dealing with traumatic brain injury, and I'm going to hand it over to Erica. Thank you. You guys able to see my screen? You guys hear and see? We can hear you. Okay. I'm having a hard time seeing your screen. Um, sorry, trying to figure that out. I'm sharing Zoom. What you can Content? do is you can maybe try to email it to me and I can pull it up. And while I'm doing that, maybe we can, let's see. Is it showing? No. Uh, yes, we can see your computer screen now. Okay. We're good to go? Yeah, we can see your computer screen. We just don't see a PowerPoint or anything. Yeah, we can just see your desktop, Erica. Oh. Okay. Well, how do I fix that? You still uh, can't see my presentation? No. What all? Okay. Um, what you can do is send me an email and I'll pull it up on my computer with your slides and um, 
we'll just move on to the EMS Educator Award, and then we'll come back to the um, to your presentation, Dr. QB. Perfect. Sorry about that. That's okay. Dr. Dietrich, can you uh, hear me right now? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can. I'm going to hand it over to you now. Sounds wonderful. So I am Dr. Ann Dietrich, and I'm the medical director of the Franklin County Firefighters Grant Medical Center EMS Education Program. First, I wanted to thank all of you out there, pre-hospital providers, for all you do. It's really appreciated. Um, EMS educators form the backbone of a comprehensive and successful learning experience. EMT and paramedic educators must have, as we all know, integrity, flexibility, be trusted, encourage inclusion, and act in a collaborative manner. Today's education environment is complex and rapidly changing, especially over the last seven weeks. An engaged educator serves as a subject matter con content expert, a researcher, a coordinator, a liaison, and many more. To recognize members and supporters of our EMS education team, Ohio Health is proud to present the Excellence in EMS Education Award. Nominees must have demonstrated impact that's representative of his or her actions. I'd like to share some of the content comments from students of this year's recipient with you. Chuck is hands down the best instructor. He has the class's best interest in mind at all times and will go the extra mile to make sure you leave the classroom understanding the material. Chuck is an awesome teacher and extremely accessible. He seems to genuinely care for the success of each student and is great with both constructive criticism and encouragement. Devotion to this profession and a genuine devotion to the well being and education of all students in a class are two traits I most admire. He is invested and available to students. This embodies what it is to be a professional educator and a world class instructor. Nothing is given, all is earned, and he is highly respected. We are very honored to present this year's Ohio Health Excellence in EMS Education Award to Charles Cottrell. Congratulations to Chuck. Thanks for all you do for our students. You're an incredible inspiration to all of us, and we really appreciate um, the time you spend with our classes, our students, and how you bring it to the community. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Thanks to Chuck and all of those, all of my instructors out there. We appreciate you. All right, so we're gonna we're gonna just change things up, but one more time here, we're gonna bring in uh, Beth to talk about high flow pediatric oxygenation. Can you hear us, Dr. Bulbus? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. Okay, great. I'm gonna, um, up, I'm gonna pull up your slideshow right now and then we'll be good to get started here in a second. Perfect. So I am um, EMS liaison from Nationwide Children's Hospital and uh, pediatric emergency medicine doc there. Uh, in my prior life, I was a pediatric cardiologist and electrophysiologist, so um, uh, I bring that sort of background with me. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk about non-invasive respiratory support in pediatrics, specifically about high flow, but I've also added on a little bit about uh, CPAP. Um, with the COVID-19 focus of this um, this meeting, I have to say I'm I'm happy that it hasn't really affected the pediatric population tremendously. Um, I um, can you still hear? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure. Um, so I, I um, am happy that it hasn't really had a huge effect on uh, pediatrics. I don't think that necessarily means that it won't in the future because I think this virus is mutating and um, we just um, uh, kind of have to be ready to hit a moving target. But um, if we 
go to the next slide, we'll first start, uh, talk about high flow nasal cannula oxygen. So what is it? It's a system which delivers heated humidified oxygen, which is a little bit different than just pumping up the flow volume on regular oxygen. It uses a special cannula, which will include 25 to 50% of the nares. This is a little bit more important the smaller you get and uh, possibly more standardized in adult patients. Um, flow, weight, flow rates are calculated in pediatrics up to about 1 to 2.5 liters per minute per kilo. And um, the maximum of 60 liters per minute can be delivered by some systems. Other systems can only deliver 50. Uh, I was going to take this out, but with some of the um, pretty big kids that we're seeing, this might apply. Um, you can regulate the delivery of flow and the oxygen percentage independently. So this makes high flow nasal cannula oxygen useful in patients who are not hypoxic who may have increased work of breathing. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, there are two uh, commercially available high flow nasal cannula oxygen systems. This um, photo is taken from um, rebelem.com, which has a really nice presentation on high-flow nasal cannula oxygen and how it works, uh, talks about the physiology. Although the setup is different, um, uh, the delivery is about the same. You can see that this um, it does take up some space. Um, uh, we'll talk about the use of um, either system in um, pre-hospital medicine. Uh, next slide. So how does it work? Uh, with the humidified uh, and heated uh, oxygen delivery, it can actually help to clear mucus. The, the oxygen flow and the humidity is heated to body temperature. Uh, this actually, rather than increasing inflammation and decreasing mucus clearance, can improve ciliary function and can help the patient to clear the mucus. Uh, this is a big problem with uh, bronchiolitis in uh, small children. It can decrease the caloric expenditure of breathing by relieving that work of breathing. And um, it overcomes the concept of dead space in the oropharynx. Uh, this will help to wash out CO2, and whereas traditional nasal cannula or oxygen face mask delivery um, can't really wash out the CO2 in the dead space of the posterior pharynx, um, high flow nasal cannula oxygen, because um, by virtue of the high flow can do that. Uh, next slide. So if you look here, um, this is uh, also from Rebel EM. Um, the high flow nasal cannula is applied to the nose. It um, it basically outstrips the tidal volume or the flow of the of the person who's in respiratory distress. It fills this whole nasopharyngeal cavity with um, with high um, concentration of oxygen. But even perhaps more importantly, it helps to wash out the CO2 by the high flow, and therefore. Um, decreases the rebreathing of carbon dioxide. Uh, this um, can actually help with ventilation, help with oxygenation, and then as we talked about, the humidified um, oxygen will help with uh, clearance of mucus. Uh, next slide. So in, in a, the adult literature, and I can't really speak to um, practical applications with adults, but there's a, a myriad of situations where it can be helpful. In pediatrics, I would say the, the um, primary use is in bronchiolitis. It has been used in asthma and uh, pneumonia. Uh, it can be used in undifferentiated respiratory distress when, when the patient's in distress, and um, but an invasive airway is not available or, or not desirable. Um, uh, next slide. So there are a few pitfalls, although this is considered a very safe uh, modality and very well tolerated in kids. 
the main concerns would be in premature or very small infants that have improper cannula size. There have been some um, studies in the neonatal literature, uh, especially of preemies, that if you deliver a very high flow and the nair is completely occluded, you can deliver pretty high pressures, which could cause barotrauma in small children, like premature infants. The open mouth will decrease effectiveness. Um, you lose a lot of the flow, but even so, um, uh, it may still uh, help a lot. And um, uh, sometimes these patients will still require endotracheal intubation, although it's always best to try um, non-invasive methods if possible. Uh, it does not compensate for apnea, just like CPAP has to have a patient initiating a breath, so does uh, nasal cannula high flow oxygen. Next one. So if you look at the feasibility for pre-hospital use, the pros for high flow nasal cannula oxygen are that it's safe, it's effective in a lot of patients, especially the small patients with bronchiolitis lots of um, difficulty clearing um, secretions, and uh, small infants who are obligate nose breathers. It is non-invasive, and uh, really, except for the situation of small preemies with the improper nasal cannula size, um, there's very little harm that you can do uh, by applying it. The cons for pre-hospital use, it may be uh, limited, use may be limited by the expense of equipment, setup time, if you have a short transfer, it may be uh, valuable just to um, hook up um, traditional oxygen and crank up the flow. Um, it may be seen as an escalation of care if it's used independently and you come into the ER and say we have a patient on high flow nasal cannula oxygen. Um, flow rate can be difficult to maintain uh, over long distances of transport. And some of these patients may just improve with high flow, I'm sorry, with low flow oxygen um, and the whole expense and setup of um, high flow nasal cannula oxygen may not be necessary. Um, next slide. So what does the research show? In pediatrics, high flow nasal cannula oxygen is mostly used in bronchiolitis and the results are mixed. It has definitely been shown as a useful adjunct, but in uh, studies where they compare it to traditional oxygen delivery, it has not been shown to be clearly superior. Uh, the clinical experience of working with these patients um, shows that some patients uh, respond quite well to it and respond right away, uh, whereas others will uh, definitely require uh, invasive uh, endotracheal intubation and, and um, ventilation this way. And then some patients respond to low flow oxygen uh, and the high flow nasal cannula oxygen setup and expense is not necessary. Uh, studies are hard to compare because a lot of times the um, the endpoints or the um, patient recruitment are different. Uh, the major concerns are in very small premature infants, and there is really not much information on high flow nasal cannula oxygen in the pre-hospital situation. Uh, next slide. So I wanted to just have a minute to talk about continuous uh, positive airway pressure. It is another non-invasive modality for respiratory support and in fact is usually the next step that we would go to in bronchiolytic children um, uh, after high flow nasal cannula oxygen or if we feel like it's, um, high flow is not gonna work for them, then we may go uh, directly to nasal CPAP uh, or um, uh, 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 just the face mask CPAP. So, it is my understanding that it's routinely used in transport of adults, but uh, has not really been used in uh, pre-hospital transfer of patients until an innovative program was started by Westerville EMS to use in pediatrics. Um, next slide. So if we look at CPAP versus high flow nasal cannula, 
uh, in in CPAP, placing the mask on a child may require sedation. Now, some kids just feel so much better with the uh, extra support that they won't need it, but a lot of these kids will fight the mask. Uh, whereas high flow nasal cannula, once you have it placed, they may sort of renege on the um, placement of it, but once it's in place, it's usually well tolerated. CPAP provides a bit more support, um, but neither is effective in apnea. I think both in the pre-hospital setting face the challenge of expensive equipment, needing special sizes for pediatrics, and then choosing the proper uh, size of either nasal cannula or face mask for pediatric patients. Um, and then uh, one advantage of CPAP is that you can deliver nebulized albuterol through the apparatus, whereas with high flow, if you're having this in place, then you're gonna also have to place them a mask over the nasal cannula, which can be a little bit challenging uh, in some um, combative pediatric patients. Uh, next slide. So um, I just wanted to sort of give an overview of what uh, Westerville did when they started their pediatric CPAP program. The first step was developing a protocol for use, and uh, the protocol is pretty straightforward with um, with uh, respiratory distress and, and um, you know, patient able to initiate their own breath. Then funding for equipment, they actually had to put together a sort of um, uh, their own packet with all the connectors so that they could connect this to their existing ventilators. Then uh, used uh, simulation training and a uh, couple of our educators from Nationwide went in to help them to um, address specific pediatric aspects or differences in pediatric applications. And then uh, we are providing oversight on their cases. Uh, they've had relatively few patients because shortly after the initiation of this program, then we uh, came into COVID system and, and we're uh, avoiding aerosolizing procedures of which this would be considered um, at risk. Plus, we're out of the bronchiolitis season. Um, we haven't seen tons of asthma, although we're seeing a little bit with uh, all the pollen in the air. So the, the need for it in the summer is way less than what we saw during the uh, busy cold and flu season. Uh, next slide. This is a picture of uh, what the pediatric nasal CPAP apparatus looks like. Uh, and you can see that it's pretty uh, similar to the adult setup that we saw in a previous lecture. Uh, the difference is the floaties or some sort of restraint device that um, the children may need. Uh, next. So in summary, high flow nasal cannula oxygen and CPAP are both non-invasive alternatives to endotracheal intubation for respiratory support in patients in pediatrics, um, uh, especially in those, well, only in those who are not apneic. The main use is in bronchiolitis, but it ha also has applications in pneumonia and asthma. And uh, pre-hospital use may be limited by cost and equipment, but as it becomes more, uh, useful and, and more standard, standardized, uh, then this may bring the cost down um, as the um, vendors may have a wider distribution. I'd be happy to take any, um, any questions. Thanks, Beth. Any questions? Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bulbus. Uh, I had a Two questions. I uh, wanted to have you expand uh, for a review on uh, the definition of uh, dead space and the difference with uh, uh, what that terminology means. And then just a very quick uh, review of bronchiolitis as um, that could uh, deem some review uh, for some of our providers out there. If you could do that, we would appreciate it. Yes, that's uh, great questions. Uh, let me just start with the second question first. Um, bronchiolitis is, um, I guess, in a in a um, a um, basic sense, it's sort of the um, pediatric equivalent of what adults call bronchitis, and and it's a small airways disease. 
It is uh, fraught with problems in the smallest patients, especially uh, those under one year of age, but we can see it affect uh, two and three-year-olds uh, significantly. The biggest risk is in the, um, say, birth to two or three months because they have a biggest risk for apnea. Um, the most effective treatment for bronchiolitis is nasal suctioning um, and supportive care. Uh, remembering that the youngest infants are, na are obligate nose breathers. They cannot breathe through their mouth. Uh, they have trouble with um, feeding if their nose is plugged up, and then they become dehydrated, uh, which causes other, you know, um, just sort of cascades all of their problems. Once they're dehydrated, the mucus gets thicker, they uh, are fussier, they have more trouble breathing, et cetera. Um, so bronchiolitis uh, is a, the biggest challenge in the smallest patients, uh, and it's, um, I, I think the biggest take home is, is suction, suction, suction. Uh, it's typically caused by the respiratory syncytial virus, but we can see a similar pattern with, with uh, many other viruses. Um, with regard to dead space, this is area in the, um, the mouth, the posterior pharynx, or the lungs, or the airways that is not used for gas exchange. And particularly in the back of the throat, the posterior nas nasopharynx, this area usually is sort of a reservoir, and with, with respiratory embarrassment or compromise, uh, CO2 can build up in here. And the major uh, assistance that uh, high flow nasal cannula oxygen can give is that the high flow can overcome that uh, problem of sort of um, uh, CO2 um, retention in this area. It can, it can replace that CO2 in the dead space or the areas that, that just hold air and oxygen can replace that with highly oxygenated um, um, gas and uh, thereby improve oxygenation. Uh, that's kind of a simplistic um, explanation. Uh, thank you very much for those uh, uh, clear explanations of, of, of these concepts. Uh, we appreciate it very much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Bobos. That was excellent. That's a lot to think about in our pediatric patients. All right, so we're going to move to our last presentation with Dr. Kubi. We're going to talk about uh, traumatic brain injury and hypoxia and hypotension. Uh, and I'm going to hand it over to Erica and pull up your slides here. You'll be good to go. All right. Can you guys hear me okay? Can you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So, um, I first off wanted to um, congratulate Dr. Schneider on the EMS Medical Director of the Year Award. Um, I'm lucky to call him a colleague as well, and um, it's a well-deserved award, so congratulations to him. Um, and I also wanted to thank everybody for what you do every day. Um, I also started my career um, as an EMT. Um, I didn't do it very long before I went to medical school, but gave me a lot of appreciation for what you do every day and inspired me to do the job that I do and to be a medical director. Um, I also work for Mid-Ohio Emergency Services and I'm the medical director at Concord Fire Department as well as Morrow County EMS. So um, I'm gonna to talk to you briefly about hypotension and hypoxia and traumatic brain injury. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so this is a very important topic because traumatic brain injury causes more death and disability and is more costly than other forms of trauma. Um, and they estimate about 2% of the US population is actually living with major traumatic brain related disability. Um, and what's important for what we can do is that the injury itself could be significantly worsened by secondary events beyond the initial trauma. So this is um, where what we do becomes very important. Uh, the injured brain is even more sensitive to the secondary insults um, from ischemia. So avoiding ischemic insults um, with hypotension and hypoxia may be, most, may be one of the most powerful means that we have to improve outcomes for these patients. Next slide, please. So there was a study back in 2001 that had just about 100 patients. Um, their median GCS score was seven. 
um, and they showed an overall mortality rate of about 43%. Um, 26 patients had recorded hypotension in the ED and 65% of them died. Um, they did not find any statistically significant data regarding hypoxia, but their study was um, not a large number of patients and was specifically an ED study. They um, included patients with a GCS less than 12, um, and then they started measuring their blood pressure and oxygen levels um, on arrival to the ED and every two minutes after. So this didn't really include um, pre-hospital information. Next slide, please. So then there was another um, study back, or excuse me, done in 2017 um, that looked at pre-hospital data of a large amount of um, patients, um, over 13,000 um, over seven year period. Um, of these patients, there were 4.6% or 604 patients that were hypotensive, divine, defined as a um, systolic blood pressure less than 90. Uh, they had 6% or 709 patients that were hypoxic with an O2 sat of less than 90%. And then just 212 or 1.6% of the patients were both hypotensive and hypoxic. Go to the next slide. So basically this um, data that they published showed that the combination of hypotension and hypoxia in the pre-hospital setting were associated with um, increased crude and adjusted odds of death compared with either of these physiologic insults alone. Um, combination of the hypoxia and hypo hypotension um, associated with a more than doubling risk of death compared with having either alone. Based on their data, they didn't um, find any um, uh, effect of either of those variables on each other. Um, so independently, they verified these um, as causing the increased risk of death as indicated in these charts. I think this study is important because it was a pre-hospital study and had a large number of patients. So this is very applicable to what we do. You can go to the next slide, please. That's basically a summary of what I just talked about. We'll go to the next slide. So this becomes important because we've talked a lot about permissive hypotension and trauma and that we don't want to over resuscitate people um, who are having a hemorrhagic injury. Um, that's uh, very important that we consider these patients with um, traumatic brain injury um, that we may need to work on preserving their perfusion and oxygenation. So the permissive hypertension has shown some survival benefit over conventional resuscitation in patients with hemorrhagic injury. A lot of these patients have multiple injuries, so kind of have to take all of these issues into consideration. Um, so the ATLS guidelines um, have basically state that every effort should be made to enhance cerebral perfusion and blood flow by reducing the elevated intracranial pressure, maintaining normal intravascular volume, maintaining a normal mean arterial blood pressure, and restoring, restoring normal oxygen and normal capnia. So it's a um, kind of a triad to consider the acidosis, coagulopathy, hypothermia, and maintaining perfusion. Can go to the next slide, please. Um, so I apologize. I had a couple other slides that I didn't transfer on the email correctly, but um, some strategies to avoid hypotension and hypoxia, considering um, early intubation and ventilating with 100% oxygen. Um, there is some thought of hyperventilation can cause vasoconstriction and decrease um, herniation of the brain. Um, caution to only use that if there's a severe traumatic brain injury with acute neurologic deterioration because the reduced um, partial pressure um, CO2 causes vasoconstriction. And if you cause too much vasoconstriction, that can actually cause more ischemic injury to the brain. Um, so in general, the guidelines recommend keeping the PaCO2 at 35 um, millimeters of mercury or above. Um, and also it's important to check the GCS before um, giving patients sedatives or paralytics. Um, that's very important information for us to gauge um, how they're doing you know, after, from what you see pre-hospital and then what we're seeing in the emergency department and beyond. Um, euvolemia should be established as soon as possible with IV fluid. They recommend normal saline or LR. Um, we don't wanna overdo it with um, too much glucose and things like that because that's been shown to have um, detrimental effects further down um, the patient's course. Certainly if they're having um, a bleeding um, issue that that's causing their hypotension, they may need um, blood products as well. Um, caution to consider patients that are having seizures. Um, important to remember that 
you can make them stop seizing, at least look like they're stop seizing by giving them muscle relaxers or paralytics. But if they're still having seizures in the brain, that can be severely um, detrimental to the brain tissue. Um, so they're going to need appropriate anti-seizure treatment. Um, always consider cervical spine injuries as well. Um, as far as the medication issues, um, the thought that giving um, lidocaine before intubation, decreasing the increased ICP is no longer recommended. Um, fentanyl can be used to blunt the sympathetic uh, stimulation of intubation. Um, ketamine may also be a good option if the patient's hypotensive um, because that may have less uh, effect on their blood pressure. Um, so basically there is a lot that we can do um, in the pre-hospital setting in the emergency department to take care of these patients, trying to avoid um, episodes of hypotension and hypoxia. Um, as this uh, paper shows, there is really a detrimental effect to having either of those things happen to the patient. So we can really hopefully make a big difference for these uh, brain injured patients. There's one more slide. Thank you, Dr. Kuby. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the panel? If not, I had one brief one for you. The hypotension, the exposure in those studies was categorical, meaning below or above 90 millimeters of mercury. Do you think, especially in the setting of our elderly patients with higher than higher than normal uh, systolic blood pressures. Do you think that same relationship would be continuous? And rather than having the mortality be less than 90, do you think for certain populations it is maybe 100 or 120, or there's some degree of mortality that's increased with each stage that you drop your blood pressure? That's a good question. I'm sure we're normally significantly hypertensive. If they're 90, they're probably going to be unconscious versus somebody who's normally normotensive. Um, so I'm sure there probably is some way to stage that. I don't know if, that there's been enough studies to say that. And this is, like you said, just looking at an isolated number and applying that to everybody. Um, I think much like the permissive hypotension, um, you know, assessing the patient's mental status, if they're able to talk to you and, you know, their blood pressure is not exactly 90, but could be higher than that. That might be a good way to assess that they're um, having good um, preservation of their brain function, meaning that they have enough perfusion to perfuse their brain properly. Hopefully there'll be some more studies on this. I think it's a good topic, important for us to kind of gauge further what how we can make a difference for these patients. Yes, thank you. I, I think this is a really good example of how doing the small things and just keeping the fundamentals can really impact the outcome for your patients. Um, even if you're only with them for a half hour or 20 minutes or whatever it is. Absolutely. Any other questions from the panel? All right. Well, that was excellent. Thank you. Um, so that concludes our virtual conference, our um, short hitting, fast paced topics. Um, I want to uh, thank our Panelists, our speakers, your expertise was awesome. Those are great talks. Um, I also want to thank Holly and Mark Huckabee and Barb Dean and everybody else at Ohio Health EMS. Uh, there was a lot of behind the scenes work that went into this. And um, Holly and Mark and Barb did a great job of helping prepare for this, as they always do. So thank you very much. Um, and then lastly, I just want to thank our EMS providers again for all that you do. We appreciate all of your hard work and dedication. Uh, and I'm gonna hand it over to Holly for some closing remarks. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I want to uh, echo your sentiments as well. <clears throat> uh, thank you to the presenters. Uh, it was uh, amazing that uh, we could um, flex and, uh, and have all of these uh, uh, medical directors come together uh, in short order and, and bring their expertise into a virtual setting. Uh, we, uh, we're sorry that we're not able to be at the convention center with everyone today celebrating EMS week, but, uh, 
and given our situation, we are hopeful that this is the best uh, thing that we can do at this time. Uh, we hope you found it entertaining and, and most importantly, informative so that you can, uh, you are able to uh, provide uh, excellent care and get good continuing education to support that excellent care. Uh, on behalf of Ohio Health and Ohio Health EMS, we want to thank you uh, and uh, appreciate you uh, during uh, National EMS Week and um, take care and be safe. Uh, if you have any questions with the continuing ed uh, that comes with these presentations that were given today, uh, please do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, you can contact us uh, by phone by uh, email and uh, um, any questions that you have or needs uh, please know that Ohio Health EMS is, uh, is here or uh, we have not uh, stopped and we can answer any of your questions and any means you prefer to contact us so again thank you and happy EMS week <laughs>